people want to meet people they don't want to meet technology. This is Justin, co-founder of Safari, the first community of the top growth leaders in Web3. He joins us today to talk about his playbook of successfully creating communities. Justin, you successfully founded Safari Club, a growth talent collective and accelerator with contributors from the most successful companies in the industry. Taking a step back, which strategy did you pursue when launching Safari? The way that we created Safari is when we, when we were first starting Safari was January of this year. And we looked around at a lot of the communities in Web3 and they were open, they were large, there were thousands of people. Uh, they were text-based and that didn't really seem like a community to me. It was a little too unwielding um, and I was looking to build a community for myself basically. I was looking for other Web3 growth leaders like myself who um, wanted to know and, and chat about what the future of Web3 growth looks like. And so since I wanted to create this community for myself and I didn't really know where I was going to go with it, I wanted to make it as easy as possible for me to run. Um, and I looked at all these discords that were super large and crazy. And I was like, this is like a huge burden that I don't want to have. Like, what can I do to make it like simple for me to run and also get value? And so that, that started with Safari being 40 people. Um, so I went the other direction. I thought instead of open, we're going to be closed instead of, um, text based, we're going to be audio based, uh, and we're going to be small instead of really large and we're going to stay small over time and grow gradually and so we we started safari as that group of 40 and now we're we're 300 uh, but we we've accepted only around 12 percent of those who have applied so uh, we have a much wider audience of people who are still waiting to get into safari um, and it's really exciting time to be building communities how did you come up with this unique approach to do it exactly the other way around? I've been doing growth for the last four years before this. And one really key growth lesson that I learned is that when conventional wisdom is wrong, there's a really big opportunity. So an example of that is at my last company, the conventional wisdom was that Craigslist was our best channel, the highest ROI channel, but that it was unscalable. Uh, and that we would never be able to scale it. And I looked at that problem and said, but what if we can scale it and figured out a way to scale it, uh, which nobody thought was possible before. And that ended up being a really powerful channel that drove more than 25% of our acquisition uh, and still does today, even post we leave in the company. Um, so that's one, one lesson. And another lesson, I, when I originally learned this lesson was from a founder or was from a head of growth at a data company who they had created this really awesome pillar page strategy for SEO. But I was looking at all these SEO pages and saying to him, I thought that duplicate content hurt SEO and you have like all these hundreds of thousands of pages with similar duplicate content. And he was, and he told me exactly this. He was like, conventional wisdom says that duplicate content is, uh, hurts SEO, but it doesn't. And if you do it in this kind of way and we found this unique opportunity and that's how we're, you know, like beating everybody in the space. And so I looked at the same right and said, conventional wisdom says you build the server, you get tens of thousands of people, you like build all these bots, you build these quest flows and blah, 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 blah. And you had incentives, financial incentives, and this is how you create a community. And I was like, I don't think that's true. What if it's wrong? I'm going to do the complete opposite and see how that goes. And it, it seems to be going better than a lot of those communities today. Today's episode is brought to you by Talent Protocol. Talent Protocol is the Web3 professional platform for high potential builders. Create Web3 resumes to make meaningful connections and to unlock access to scholarships and work opportunities. Talent Protocol is a community with a mission to help the next generation of talented builders to achieve fulfillment and success. Sign up today with the link below and receive $50 worth of TAL tokens when you complete your profile. Talking about founders, you mentioned that you've spoken to over 400 Web3 founders, operators, investors about challenges they face. What were the hottest takes? A few hot takes. The winners in the space will be ecosystem builders and not just tool builders. We started Safari Community First, which a lot of people talk about what exactly does that mean? But this is like my grand growth strategy. And I think that this is that the, the uh, 
psychology and the thought process for where L1s started, but they didn't really fully achieve is that L1s, I think, started too grand of, they really focused on, oh, this is technology and this is infrastructure, but they didn't move beyond like, well, what does that actually mean? And what that actually means is like, they're creating an ecosystem that is tracking people and they're getting to write the rules of their ecosystem. And I think that when you start community first, you also get to write the rules of your ecosystem and other people then join your ecosystem as tool builders and they have to play by your rules. And so starting community first enables you to write the rules for your ecosystem. Uh, and that gives you a, an unfair advantage over the space. So I think that both it is is much harder to build community first, uh, but I think that it's a, a long-term bet to reap the rewards of the future. With all this information in your back pocket, where do you think founders need to focus on to win in this constantly evolving industry? Other thing that I saw when I was looking at a lot of these Discord communities, as I was saying, you know, a traditional Web2 onboarding flow, you have to sign up, you have to like do the things uh, to even just like get to the free point in for joining a Discord is way too low friction, in my opinion, right? Like you just click, you're in, you look around, and then you're like, ah, I don't like this thing, and then you're out, right? It like in like a two minute span, somebody could be like in and out. And I was like, we need to increase the friction. Like some some friction to joining is, is and actually can be good friction um, in my opinion. And so for us, we also added this, you know, an application process is, our application process is light. Like it's like, hey, what's your name, your contact, what segment are you? Segment being like, are you a product leader? Are you growth leader? Are you founder, et cetera? why do you want to join and how did you hear about us that's it that's our our whole application process so it's it's a low like i'm not you're not gonna have to spend like two hours filling out the safari's application but it's enough friction that you know you have to like and go through the process that also increases some fomo too of like this is exclusive they're gonna read this what am i gonna say i want to make it good but it's not like it's gonna take me like days to do it but in terms of like tactically starting a community as I was mentioning, I don't think that people should think about these communities as they are at scale. The way that we started Safari was that I had this thought of like, I want to build this community. I don't know what it's going to look like exactly. And I just started DMing Web3 growth leaders on LinkedIn. Um, and I spoke to 10 of them, like not a huge number. Um, and that sort of like made it concrete for me that like, okay, other people are interested in this thing too. And some people gave me different tips about what they'd like to see or not like to see. And from there, I just uh, posted on LinkedIn, like, hey, we're starting the first Web3 growth community. Um, applications close in four days. And if you want to apply, we're going to be a, a starting group of 40. And then I asked those 10 people that I talked to on LinkedIn to reshare it. And we were really fortunate to get over 100 applications for our first batch. Um, but at the time, like, I was like, a nobody, right? Like I had entered Web3 a month before. I didn't know anybody, I didn't know anyone in the space. I didn't know any Web3 growth leaders. Um, and so it was kind of like, I think that a lot of communities can start that way. There are a few different elements of this starting process of Safari that I think got us there. You can think about community building in another way as just doing high quality networking at scale, right? People are attracted to meeting other interesting people more than they are attracted to meeting founders who have a, some, some product that they're building. This episode is brought to you by Lens Protocol. Lens Protocol is a Web3 social graph designed to empower creators with full ownership and control over their content and community. Lens isn't a social media app. It's a protocol that lets Web3 social apps thrive through its open source tech stack. When you create content on Lens, you own it. You control it, you take it from app to app, and you decide how it's being monetized. While Lens might just be the last social media handle you will ever need to create, what do you view as a missed opportunity that you see left untapped by a lot of founders? It is interesting how many people are building community tools that don't have communities. Uh, I think that that's a huge missed opportunity. And we actually started this way. We built a DAO tool before we built Safari. And we, when we had this DAO tool, we were going around to all these communities being like, hey, you should use our tool. And they were like, okay, but like, what other communities are using your tool? We we're like, no one, you're gonna be the first. And they were like, goodbye. Um, so then we were like, okay, like maybe we should start our own community, see, see that experience. And when we built our own community, 
then we started using our tool in our own community. We we're like, this tool sucks. This, like we cannot use this tool. Like, cause we were thinking about like, what would a community builder need at once and et cetera. And then when we actually stepped into that role, then we had gained a lot more clarity too about what are the tools that need to be built uh, in actuality rather than, you know, thinking about the needs of, of somebody that we didn't actually have those pain points personally. So I think that to the extent the founders can dog food their own products, whether it's their community tool builders having their own community so that they know what actually needs to be built, uh, or, you know, if it's an analytics product to actually use that analytics product for your own analytics. I think that, that those are the types of things that will make founders stronger uh, in their ability to uh, grow their companies. Why do you think founders are lacking on realizing the importance of community and don't prioritize it in the process of building their products? I think honestly, because it's hard. It's hard and it's long. It's a long-term thing, right? But community, I think of community a lot, like I think of SEO, is it's a lot of work up front and you don't reap the rewards until later. And a lot of people, especially when you're an early stage founder, are thinking very short-term naturally, because like everything's moving, everything's dynamic, you might have to pivot. And so I think that that's why a lot of people don't think about community. I think that also the challenge that a lot of companies face for creating their communities is if they start creating a community too far into their journey, then it's hard for them to create an authentic community because they're naturally like, oh, I'm going to like push my product through this community as an acquisition channel. And that does not, that will like not get them the high quality community members that they want. Um, it's really about, you know, one of our community members in Safari said it best is that they spend 90% of their time building trust with their community and 10% of their time spending trust with their community. And I think that those who have already built a product and built a community thinking that they're going to distribute their product through their community are probably too much on the opposite of thinking of like 10% building trust and 90% spending that trust. So I think it's how you, how you approach the community and how you think about it from the beginning. Let's circle back to community building. You predicted that community-led growth is the future of growth. How does community growth differ between Web2 and Web3 communities? I think that a lot of the assumptions that we made about how Web2 growth happened, uh, Web3 growth will be quite the opposite. So like in Web2 growth for like content, for example, uh, you had all this content that you would put on your website and it'd be like SEO content. And it'd be like, you know, like pretty like boring content. You just like be there to like make your paid drinks. But like nobody actually like thought that that was like authentic or good content. They'd find it and then they'd be like, oh, well, this content sucks. This isn't like the answer to my question. Uh, and I think that also for Web3, it's about creating small, like much less content, but higher quality, more authentic. And even to gate that content completely, have the allure of content of like thinking like, oh, wow, Safari really produces amazing content, but only within Safari. It can't be accessed unless I get into this smaller group of people. And I think that the allure of great content is often probably better than great content in itself too. So it's kind of flipping a lot of these, these conceptions that we've had about Web2 growth on its head. I think that where Web3 is taking us to is like, we're moving from a world of mass outbound communication from like a brand to like a bajillion people all at once to brands facilitating small to mid-sized group experiences where um, you can be in this group with other people and Discord does this very well, um, is that right? it's a brand bringing all these people together around a common goal or common concept, and people really enjoy that. And I think that people were looking for these types of communities uh, for a lot of different reasons. I think that COVID in particular uh, really escalated feelings of loneliness and a search for meaning and purpose that a lot of people were looking for, which I think also helps explain the like rise of digital communities in Web3 in particular is it's like not just Web3 specific, it's also like this time, this moment specific for why people were really drawn, I think, to DAOs of like, and also feeling like, you know, there are a lot of like injustices in our world and like the current system doesn't work for us, especially for people like that are that are our age, people who are in their like, you know, teens, 20s, 30s, uh, into like their, their late 30s are feeling like, hey, this world that you guys created is it working for us? It's like, you know, you can't buy a house, you can't do all these things. Like you kind of have to go on a mood shot or you have to like disrupt the system and create a new system. And I think that Web3 and communities 
tap into a lot of those those narratives and feelings that people our age have, um, which also makes them even more compelling. Another one is private traffic, which has been a marketing buzzword in China since as early as 2019. What is it and how can Web3 founders apply it? And additionally, why now, four years later? Private traffic is essentially the ability to own the relationship with your audience or your community in a channel that is specific to you. And so for China, this plays out through WeChat, which is like their super app. It's like all things c combined. It's like a messenger. It's like a payment platform. It's a profile. It's like all the things. And obviously we in the West don't don't have a super app. However, uh, we're seeing elements of this come through with, with Discord and the, the mesh of third party apps that make up the Web3 growth ecosystem. And I think that that's in particular why Discord communities have uh, risen up is that this is a private channel in which people can facilitate and access their audience and create a new experience with their audience that's not just the one-to-many that is saturated and very expensive to do today. China is a very interesting case study for us to study from the rest of the world because they saw the exact same dynamics, but because they're a little bit more of like a closed ecosystem, they experienced them, I believe, much sooner than the rest of the global economy did. Uh, and so they started adapting their strategies uh, in reaction to, to this, what it looked like today for them like three years ago. I believe that like what we see in Discord and early Web3 growth is just like a very like prehistoric growth strategy which at scale will look like what private traffic does in China. Lastly, you predicted that wallet data will change how companies grow and succeed going forward. Can you unpack this for us? Wallet data, there it's it's like a new paradigm for us. We're in kind of living in like two different privacy paradigms today of like in web two, all of your like like you are Sophie and it's like what you buy on Amazon is like private. Like I don't know what you buy on Amazon, right? Um, but in Web3, you are not Sophie, but what you buy on the internet is known to me. I can figure that out, right? <laughs> and so like, that's where wallet data comes in. Uh, I think that like, there is an interesting reckoning that I'm sure will happen at some point in time, like as more of your identity, as you become more Sophie than whatever your pseudonym is in Web3, maybe you might feel more uncomfortable with everyone knowing all of the things that you buy. Uh, especially if those things happen in Web3. Um, but I feel like we're still in this continuum of like, you're Sophie and nobody knows what you buy. And then you're you're not Sophie or something else and everyone knows what you buy. But I do think that in the interim, there's an interesting opportunity to say, you know, in Web2, we wanted to know everything about you, all the things that you ever did, because we're basing it off of like a public profile. Like we, we know you're Sophie and now what are all the things that we can learn about you? But I think that what marketers actually care about is they don't really care who you are. They care about what you do and what you buy in reality. And so I think that if we move to this new world of Web3 and people really do adopt pseudonyms, then it's, it's a, we're able to say, you're a pseudonym. We don't care that you're walking around San Francisco or London. We only care to know everything that you ever want to buy. And that helps us market to you in more interesting and novel ways. Uh, but also protects your privacy because it's like not like attached to like you, the person that's walking around London or wherever you are. Um, and I think we'll see if we end up going that way, but wallet data provides rich new data sets that never existed in Web2, at least not publicly. Uh, and that will definitely create new opportunities for marketers that didn't exist before. Last question, where are you focusing your attention on in the new year? One of the biggest gaps that we saw um, that we started building about six months ago is uh, marketing attribution. And that's basically the simple fact of um, how do you know which of your marketing channels are driving results? Um, and so that has not been known by most Web3 companies for, their se for themselves because uh, the attribution system doesn't exist yet in Web3. So that's what we've been building. And we just released the first version of our product last month and are working with 10 different companies. Uh, so that's what I think the future looks like. And what that unlocks is the ability to experiment with new marketing channels. I think that one of the reasons why people were so attached to community-like growth in Web3 is because they couldn't measure anything for community-like growth, but they couldn't measure anything else either, right? 
And when you can't measure anything, then it doesn't make sense to experiment with new channels. Like as an example, like people would spend in the bull market like 10,000 on an influencer and then they'd get the results and they'd be like, I mean, I think we saw like a, a lift in some kind of way, but I don't really know what that lift means. And then like, once you get to that point in time, do you then spend another $10,000 on an influencer? Or do you say like, I don't know what happened. So maybe we're not going to do that again. We're going to do something else. But with attribution, you could say, okay, we spent 10,000 on this influencer and that influencer drove $11,000 worth of, you know, conversion, like traffic, blah, 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 uh, actual revenue on our website. Okay. Yeah. We made a thousand bucks. Okay. It's worth doing it again. Right. Or yeah, we got like all BS traffic. We got like a thousand dollars back. So like, we're not doing that again. And like, these are like the, the real marketing decisions that uh, web three growth leaders are looking for that, that certainty of what do I do on web two channels that drives on chain web three revenue. Uh, and that's the type of certainty that we'll bring. And I think that the ability to make those types of decisions unlocks a plethora of new channels for Web3 growth leaders. Thank you so much for following along. I hope you enjoyed it. In case you did, don't forget to subscribe in order to be notified once our next video is up.